John, how can you always have the right TV for the right application without carrying hundreds of valves on your truck? You can carry the hundreds of valves on a trailer behind your truck. That's too funny. That would work, but how are you gonna do that? Maybe there's an easier way. You can use Sporlin's interchangeable cartridge style Type Q and Type BQ uh, TEVs. Type Q is a conventional design and Type BQ is a balance for TEV. Well, come on, I need easy. How easy is it? Uh, easy is one, two, three. And it serves thousands of unique applications. So what's the process? How do I put this together? First, you select the thermostatic element assembly. Then you select the body that you need. Then you select the right size cartridge for the application to get the proper capacity, TEV for your application. And then I guess it should also be said you want to actually assemble those to a single valve. That'd probably be a good idea. Indeed. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you're always carrying the right valve for the right job then. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to sporland.com and find more information on the Type Q and BQ thermostatic expansion valves. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. We've all been there in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Corel, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge, so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc. has all your solutions down cold. Probably blocked. That's what, I, that's what I thought. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. What are you doing, buddy? Half dead. It's Tuesday. It's a real feel of like 100 degrees in Chicago, and I spent the entire day in a roof mounting VFDs and blowing arbor bits apart and ready to chuck my drill off the top of the roof. I think I broke six arbor bits today. Really? Yeah, trying to drill holes for whips. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go tomorrow and uh, get what size, a What size hole? Three quarter. Why don't you just get one of those diamond bits that cuts the nice holes? I don't know. Or, or I think I'm, out. And I'm going to get a, going to get a fucking hydraulic punch tool because I am tired of dealing with it. No, what I'm saying is uh, the, the, you don't even need a fucking hydraulic one unless you're doing like two inch. You're not doing two inch, right? We are at points. We're popping holes in panels for sensors and stuff but i have so many of these damn vfds to do like i'll give dan foss this these seven and a half horsepower vfd panels probably weighed close to 200 pounds the drive is like 35 pounds you can basically <laughs> bounce this panel probably 30 feet feet from the roof and it would probably bounce up and be completely fine i don't know if they made them to take a tank shell or what but i think so i think they're i think they're like nema x i think they're meant, meant for explosion proof those white cabinets are so fucking heavy. I had to get them up on the roof. And of course we used a lift and the lift was like three feet short. So we had to manhandle them up. And then it was like 
it with me on the lift. It was overloaded, so I'm sitting there jumping, trying to get the lift to go up, doing the old go the old one control. more inch higher. <laughs> yeah. Come on, it's three foot short. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so then where's, there was where, where's the forklift at? Yeah, the no, story. Don't do that. Don't do that. There, then there was five of them, so it was just absolutely brutal today. But thank God, heat craft condensers are just absolute cake to mount these things to. I have like, a question. Yep. How come you just didn't put pallets on the top of the jack? On top of what jack? On top of the sky jack that you had. If you put the pallets on top, it would have been X amount of feet taller. You would have strapped it down over, and then the guy on the roof could pull it over. Because it was a bitch of enough with the guy I was with to even get him on top of the lift. Ah, okay. Never mind. Literally shaking as we're trying to, as, as we got the drives over our heads. I'm like, please don't drop this on me. <laughs> He's like shaking, trying to get the, the drive up and like transition and get it just on top go, of the lift. Just go, just go on top. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. It was like, I'm like, this fucking guy's going to kill me. <laughs> I've been the kid with the shaky arms. We, we were doing a big blower wheel on a BAC tower. That was not fun. Not at all. The shaft isn't like, it, what, what? it's not like a solid steel shaft. It's actually hollow. So that wasn't the big deal. It was the, the squirrel cages, just getting them fucking lined up. Oh, yeah, those are brutal. Mm-mm, I don't like it. No, sir. Not at all. I don't know. We got all these mounted, and then it was like 1 o'clock, and I was just like absolutely fucking drenched. It was well, like, how, did, was like, how did you get them that high to mount them now? So, <laughs> what do you mean on, on the condensers? Yes. I fucking held that shit while he put the bolts to <laughs> <laughs> I, it, I picked that shit up and squatted it basically and like why he put the bolts in, but I had it like set up to where all we had to do was I basically from rail to rail on those heat craft condensers is like perfect for the drive. Amount. I don't know if they did this on purpose, or <laughs> what? but like, you only got to drill two holes on the bottom of the rails to, to mount these drives, which is absolutely just cake. That's awesome. I had to hold them while, while he bolted them in. So it was not fun at all. I don't know. My only gripe with those things is they know you got to bring power in them somewhere. You think they'd give you some damn knockouts. And then, like you said, that steel is thick. It's thick. And what happens is if you're using a hole saw, it catches and wants to snap the arbor off real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I got a brand new Milwaukee M18 drill that I bought. That'll It fucking scares the shit out of me. Better the arbor than your fucking wrist, man. That's oh, all no, I it's, say. It, it, it caught with a half inch bit and about broke my wrist. It, it literally threw me up against the, the side <laughs> of the counter. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So that, that, that's that been my week so far. Yesterday we did, I don't know, five 255s to three 880As, which, yeah, not a fan of. I had to convert and 255s together, which is just a pain. Wait, what? You had to what put the com loops together for two two fifty fives to one eight eighty. I had to do three two fifty fives to one eight eighty. Lame. And then I had it then so you can convert. This is where it gets jacked up. You could take a two fifty five and just drop the program into an eight hundred. Okay, you cannot take a two fifty five program and drop it into an eight hundred a. Wait, why? It will not convert it. You have to drop it into an 800 first, convert it, and then drop the 800 file into the 800A. That's, that's so you need a you need an 800. So thank God there's one in the training center at the shop. So, so you had to gank the controller from the shop from the training center, and then basically transfer the 255 to the 800, just so you can then upgrade it to the 888A. So I have remote access to all these sites. So we're sitting in there on AKC 65, mm -hmm. backing up the site, taking the backup, saving it on the USB, dropping it in the 800, taking that file, saving it again, <laughs> dropping it in the 800A. It is a fucking glorified clusterfuck. <laughs> the only thing I have relatable to that. When I was back in Connecticut, there was a customer that was upgrading all their older older controllers to newer firmware because they were upgrading because their stores are planning on getting remodeled. This is when they came out with the E2E. This is when you started having the 
four point something numbers. And I was upgrading firmware all the way back to 2.12 or something like that. And then had to upgrade it to get it up to a certain one to get it up to a three. And then once I can get it up to a three, then I could convert it to the four. So every single time, like validating set points, you're sweating. You're like, is it going to, is everything going to convert? Is everything going to be there? Is it going to be a pain in the ass? And then that's when I learned the very valid and important lesson about a lot of customers that do supermarket. They lock down their IP ports if it senses another MAC address. Now, what that means is it's if you're taking a, a computer that normally doesn't go to that store and you plug in your computer, it'll lock down that communication port. I am sitting there for three hours thumbing through something thinking that I fucked something up for hours. And then finally I call this guy. He's like, oh, yeah, it locks down the port. I was like, the instructions say nothing about locking down the port. They say just do this. Nothing about locking down the port. So, yeah, now I know. Yeah, don't plug your laptop in, especially if you're at a customer where they have a like all the controllers going to a router and then one com line, unplug the store com line and then do all that. But no, like that's how we've been doing these and it's a pain in the ass. It sounds like it. Yeah, and then some things don't transfer over. So like EPRs, mm -hmm. separates don't transfer over. Oh, that sucks. So you got to go through every single one and then make sure everything's good. So I have the controllers, like we have all, I have all the, the 255s temped into the same power supply off a of plug. Easy chain back so they can look through them and see what's to what. But then I had to co combine controllers. So like I was able to save one rack, all the other racks I had to program by hand. <laughs> and then this- well, that, Hold on, I have a question now because you said you had three controllers that went into one. So my question is that you had to, did you have to just load one controller and then add on to the other shit on the program? Oh. One was rack A, got, rack A got copied and then rack B and C had to be done by hand. Yeah. And here's the thing that really gets messed up. This particular customer doesn't want repeating nodes in the store. Repeating nodes? So oh. if, if rack A has node one, nothing oh. else in the store could have node one. So like the HVAC can't have node one, the other rack controllers can't have a node one. You can only have one node one in the entire store, which if you're doing these by hand and it's like a store, you're just going through and doing, it's not a big deal because that, and you start with rack A and then you go to rack B and say you end at rack A and node nine, mm -hmm. rack B, node 10 is your next one. This is copied. So all the HVAC was copied. The other two, two rack controllers were copied so, so we had to go, go back in there and readdress it yes and then refix all the addresses on all the nodes to make it so you didn't skip any my dyslexic ass struggles <laughs> so much with that so i'm sitting there writing this down eight equals 13 now <laughs> and i'm sitting there trying to do all these and i'm just like oh my god please don't screw this all up <laughs> oh man yeah, that's basically my week. But tonight, guys, we're going to talk about some high ambient CO2 stuff. Brett's got a couple of things he wanted to talk about. And then I wanted to go over some of the optical eye troubleshooting for the oil systems. We could throw that in there. But Brett, you want to take it off? Yes. Yeah, so I had a guy uh, call me the other day and he was having an issue with the HPV was just every single time that would it would say whatever pressure that it needed to be at. And it would start to just close more the more so than what it needed to open, right? It was in transcritical mode, and it, the drop leg was like, like 85, 90 degrees. So it needed it to run, and it just, man, it, the HPV would just kept closing like when it was supposed to be opening. We even tried fucking with the PID, and, and he ended up calling Danfoss, and I think they were saying that they thought that the 326 was just failing. So... Did anybody check the subcooling number? What subcooling it was number was five, uh, whatever five is, five or three. So it was reading like five or three degrees of subcooling? No, what it was reading perspective? No, no, I don't know what it was. So, I, I just know what the set point is. So that's a, so if you go in and you hold like the, like you go into the program settings, mm -hmm. it's in one of the U's. I don't remember which U it is without looking at the manual, but it's in one of the U settings. And it'll tell you what the actual subcooling readout is. 
whether something's jacked up with that. If it was hitting its subcooling value, that, that could be an issue. But if it was, there's no way it was because it was it was it could have been. If the no, because he would have measured that when he was doing the pressure temperature checks. If it's run transcritical, you have no idea what the PT chart is. True. So it's all it's all inside that controller. Now, did he check the temp sensors on the damp house controller? Mm -hmm. So it was good. It wasn't hot. It wasn't, it wasn't in sunlight, anything like that. Not getting any jacked up value there. So the HPV just kept shutting? Yeah. It would close from that good on a zero. And it wasn't pumped down because we disabled that. And so it saw that the Danfoss controller shows off when you have the, the enable disabled. So I knew it wasn't that. And, but it just kept diving down. We had to keep raising, I think, N82 or something like that to raise the uh, maximum operating gas cooler pressure or something like that just for temporary, just to get the thing to roll. So what was the receiver pressure doing? It was high at that point. It was about 572. That's why it was shutting down. So that there's that P band for the max receiver pressure. I don't mm -hmm. remember what, what, exactly what it is, but it's in that band where it starts shutting down the, the HPV to protect the receiver. So th that's why it was... It's not a bad 326. It's a if the receiver it, pressure was higher than what it was anticipated, because there is a high end band for that. If I guess it, you're telling me if it hits that, then it shuts down the HPV. That's what the logic is of the controller. Yeah. So the HPV is helping regulate. It, it's looking at your drop like subcooling, but it's also helping watch that receiver pressure too. Okay. So I'm looking for this setting right now. So there's receiver reference, which is in 91, which is either your set point, and then there's uh, where is this? Okay, it's N58, which is max receiver pressure. Okay, so, right, so I must have not read that part. Where it, does it say it in the description of what it's doing with the in conjunction with what happens when it hits that? So this is what it says: the function monitors the pressure in the receiver and will initiate the closing of the ICTMS valve mm -hmm. if the pressure exceeds the value. The value must be at least one bar over re over the reference, so it's got to be one bar higher than the, the your set point. Mm -hmm. The function is not active when N fifty nine is set to zero. Mm. So N fifty nine is the P band for that. So y y it was shutting because your receiver pressure was too high. Gotcha. So th that that's why, like anytime, like we're having head pressure issues mm -hmm. a lot. Times if it's not a dirty condenser, it's more than likely it's uh it's receiver pressure issues. Flash gas bypass valve failed, something like that. The high pressure valve sticking open, but so generally good. If we have something like that, then the I guess the obvious thing would be try to just calm down the rack by pumping everything down at that point, right? No, it's no. probably gonna brick it up and make it worse. Okay. So if you're having receiver pressure issues. Like my thing is the first thing I'm going to go to is I'm going to look at the valve on the actual 326 since I already got it pulled up. If it's you, where is it? I don't know. Let me look at I, it. I haven't messed with one of these in a while. Okay. So it's, so the U4 is the high pressure valve, your percentage. And then U24 is going to be your flash gas bypass valve. So that's okay. going to be your, your percentage open of your flash gas bypass valve. So U24, you're going to want to take a look at. And if U24 is at 100%, you got something fucked up here. Something's wrong. So okay. I would go over to it, and if it's whistling through there and it's not right, you could start to pump it down, but it's going to make – I it usually makes it worse. Okay. So I, th I thought if you'd be able to just settle everything down, just get every, everything pumped down where it doesn't even have the case load to worry about and just worries about the medium temp load. The the problem with that is you're putting all the load in the tank. They can't handle the load. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes so, sense. If you could shut some circuits down, then yeah, that would probably help take some load off of it or mm -hmm. shut the load temp off, take some load off of it. Yeah. So you either got two things. So if you're at a hundred percent, and you're not running all the compressors, mm -hmm. generally the valve's fucked up. Say that one more time. If what if that N400, N24? N24 is at 100%, and it's whistling through there. 
and you're not running a, almost 100% capacity on the medium temp, then the valve is fucked up. Because if, if the valve was truly at 100%, it would be sending so much vapor to the medium temp that it would load the rack up. So it, it would load up the medium temp compressors. If you're, because, oh, you're, you're talking about the valve, the BGV then? Yes. Okay. Okay. Because, okay. I see what you're saying. So they, they don't want to open that up 100% because they fear that they'll overload the medium temp. Yeah, it's there. It could open 100% if it needs it, but it should never need to open that much. But if it is 100% open, it would be overloading the medium temp suction. Mm -hmm. But if it okay. isn't, more than likely the valve is stuck. And if it's a Danfoss valve, it's probably broken. How many times do you find where the strainer and the, those those I, ICM valves are plugged up? The high pressure valves on occasion, if it's one manufacturer from Canada, like every time, we usually clean them on startup, but they're like filthy. Most of the US stuff, not very often. Usually if you have a plug strainer, what you'll end up having is you'll have high pressure issues. You'll have high pressure, high subcooling. You're going to have high valve percentages on the high pressure valve. Oh, so it's gonna want to stay open like a hundred ninety or whatever the max is, trying to open up, and it's still gonna be flashing off there, right at the valve. Correct. It, it does some wild stuff because, like, when it goes to high head, it's gonna fucking shut because it's gonna try to protect the receiver. Yes. So it's gonna it's gonna try to shut. So, like, most of the time, if you graph your average valve percentage, you'll see it higher. Okay. Generally, they're like fifty to forty percent. If you start seeing them creep up 80%, like in the middle of winter time, yeah, they may get that high. But if you see them like 60 to 70%, there's something wrong. It shouldn't be open that much unless it's that dramatically oversized, but generally they're undersized. Generally they're oversized. But a, a, a big symptom of a plug strainer in that sense is going to be high subcooling and high valve percentages. But what I think you guys had was definitely a BGV problem. So what happens is those Danfoss CCMT 42s and 35s, I think, what happens is they get worn out and they get overdriven because of tuning issues. So the receiver pressure is not tuned. The 326 is all over the place and it overdrives it. It hunts. So it ends up wearing out the valve and it ends up breaking, either breaking the stem or it ends up shorting the valve out. And it, just, it doesn't move anymore. So that that's generally what I've found with, with those Danfoss valves is they generally either break and you'll hear them. It sounds like a choo-choo whistle off a train, just like whistling through there. Like generally it's halfway open or whatever. So if you want to go throw your SMA on one of those, so instead of wiring it red, green, white, black, all you do is invert black and white and you could drive it with the SMA. Really? Okay. All right. Yeah. Cause they, have, on this one, they have the CCM 20 valve. A CCM then, 20 yeah. for the, okay. And for probably for the BGV. And then it looks like the IM ICM TS 20 B 66. Okay. So you get that mag drive valve on the, mm -hmm. for the high pressure. Yeah. So you probably have a broken, you probably have a bad CCM T valve. Gotcha. Or it lost its position, but if it lost its position, it's probably bad. Gotcha. So I've seen more flash gas bypass valve failures than I have high pressure valves. But I've never seen a high pressure valve fail. Hmm. But they don't get driven like that. Like generally on a well-tuned rack, the high pressure valve is fairly steady. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be. As long as your, your drop leg or your drain leg or your gas cooler isn't all over the fucking place, it should stay pretty heady steady. Correct. The only time they get like wild is in the winter time when it's when you're running the fans off a drop like temp and it's just running all over the place. Yeah. But in the middle of summertime, like it loves it. It's steady. But then other like head pressure issues is making sure like the adiabatics. I've seen so many guys miss this already. So like the adiabatic on the outside, like it has some like cottonwood dust on it. They'll like dust off the pads on the outside. Yeah. Pull the damn pads off because it's coated underneath. Yeah, like, unfortunately, those things are fucking heavy when they're wet. The Gutners aren't that bad. Yeah. Like, I, I was able to take those down by myself, but 
they're not that bad. So, but every single time they're dirty on the outside, they've been absolute blankets on the inside. I have seen so many issues where guys like look up there and they're like, oh, we brushed off the, the pads on the outside. That's great. Everything's on the inside still. They still have to be taken down and taken apart and cleaned. And then another thing with the Guntner ones, the spray nozzles in there, we found a bunch of them where the spray nozzles are not pointed down correctly. And if you take the, if you don't take a thing apart, you won't know. Are we talking? Which one are we talking about? Are we talking about the Gutner now? Yeah, the Gutner like antibiotic coils, like the or I'm not gonna say it, but oh. the <laughs> don't <laughs> stop. You're a dick to me all the time. The, there, there's a bunch of spray nozzles in there. Like half of them have been pointing at pointing at the coils or pointing like sideways, so they're not pointed correctly at the pads, and it's not wetting the pads right. The other thing with those, every single one of them, you got to call them and they'll help you fix the water problem because they, they either like just straight dump water down the drain or they work properly. Couldn't help yourself. Uh, they, they work good after they fix them. Can't fucking help yourself. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, the BAC ones you got to be concerned with. Man, I've seen the holes plug up on them on real hard, hard water stores. I've also seen it like get wavy where it doesn't like it, it somehow ekes its way out where it's not spraying directly where it needs to on those. We only have one BAC tower. Oh, okay. Uh, mo- most of the time it's just pump problems with hard water. They make a stainless steel version, I guess. They make an upgraded one that's supposed to be a little bit beefier. Yeah. A lot of it, like with those, like my biggest complaint with those is the plug coils that you can't see. So a lot of guys miss those. And then the other thing is obviously make sure all your fan motors are going. Some of these motors are deceiving and they will spin like the BAC towers and then the Gutners too. Like they'll start moving with, if a motor's out, it'll start mm-hmm. moving. It'll start getting pulled backwards from the other motors that ends up fucking up the condenser. So if it's out, saran wrap that damn thing. Yeah. Just so it pulls the air directly through the middle of the other ones. Yeah, because you don't want it pulling, you're down a motor, you don't want it to lose any more. If you're struggling that much, right now, everything in Chicago is price sized for 95 degrees. We're going to hit 100 tomorrow. All these CO2 racks are sized for 95 degrees. I think we're actually going to be at 95 tomorrow. Yeah, so it's going to be 100 here with high-ass humidity. So, like, basically every old store is going to be down running on sprinklers. We've had to throw sprinklers on a couple of the CO2 racks when they were struggling. Really? We, yeah, there's a couple out here where they won't admit it, but I'm pretty sure they size the gas coolers to 90 degrees. <laughs> it's, it's, it just cannot keep up. And you have all dry coolers out there for the most part, don't you? Yes. So I'm trying to think, like, Target is the only one that ponied up the money for the Eddie bag. Well, Costco has two of them up here. But for the most part, like everybody else is like all these running dry coolers up here. Just standard gas coolers. Just a little bit bigger. But they have no load. Those seem to be okay because there's no load in an Aldi. Yeah. It seems to be okay. They're running the same rack they're running in Texas up here. Those seem to be okay. But just keeping those gas coolers clean, or especially right now, is like just key. You're better off hitting all those CO2 stores, making sure they're clean. And then the other head pressure mitigation issue is the medium temp suction. How steady is it? How's oh. your because that's where things start getting wild. Like I started when I'm doing this my commissioning and stuff, I started taking big loads out of like defrost. I don't want anything from like one o'clock to five o'clock. I only want small stuff going in then. In the heat, the hottest part of the day, I don't want the giant dairy cooler coming out of defrost. And it loading up the rack. It that's just not good for anybody. Today's episode is sponsored by the RefRush Shield RDP series differential pressure monitors from Westermeyer Industries, now available for transcritical CO2 systems in addition to other common pressures and refrigerants. When the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Wait too long to replace, and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout. 
but replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The RDP series differential pressure monitors, including the new transcritical CO2 model, are available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyerin.com. That's W-E-S-T-E-R-M-E-Y-E-R-I-N.com. You're, you're absolutely right. Actually, when I was out in Arizona, we, we were having problems with the suction pressure and James and I were discussing what to do as far as changing the, the PID a little bit. Because you'd have these big humps and then you had the pressure drop across the piping because you have all these units just wanting to feed and then they're trying to keep up too, trying to calculate their superheat. But the set points or the, the saturated suction is always changing. So the calculation is always changing. Once we got that lined out, our pressure drop just about went away. And the rack ran so much smoother. And then you could feel that the boxes were getting a more steady pressure where we didn't have this massive pressure drop because the valves are just, oh, I don't know what to do. The, the superheat's this way. Oh, shit, it's this way. And just reacting left to right. Yeah, those MTKs controllers do a really good job of controlling superheat, though. They do a phenomenal job. And they are super easy to tune once you get the suction steady. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that suction is key because if you got that hunting going on, you're going to have head pressure issues too, guaranteed. Because that 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 medium temp suction hunting causes their receiver to hunt, which is going to cause that HPV to start closing down. Because if that if that receiver starts hunting, I guarantee you the HPV is going to start hunting with it. What you guys had, except for your guys's, was just way too high. You, you were you guys were getting close to blowing a relief. Fifteen hundred. No, I'm talking about on the receiver. Oh, 570, 576. Yeah, yeah. The, the pressure release, what, usually 635 or something? 650 usually. Yeah. You were close. It was a yeah. Little, a couple kind of wiggle I, room. I've only ever blown the high pressure reliefs on one rack, manufacturer's rack, and that's it. Yeah. Those no ones are the only ones I've ever blown reliefs on the high pressure. <laughs> What? <laughs> dick. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Some other high pressure issues. How about blow by on on the compressor? Right. If the if it's blowing by where it's not affecting the high limit and just keeps adding load. Yeah, we've seen it before where it'll max out the medium temp suction. Mm -hmm. and if it's that hot out, if it's in the nineties, your gas cooler probably can't handle it. Mm -hmm. That's another thing to watch out for that make sure that the hot gas injection valve isn't stuck so the okay. zero zone racks put a they, they have a hot gas injection valve in there i don't know if the port's bigger or what but it will overload the compressors if you leave it on like it's got enough to superheat and keep the load up that's for sure well, i'd rather so have that than the smaller ones go ahead some of them are, are made just for increase on superheat and then some of them are made for increase of superheat and or to keep the load up in case the load drops off. So everybody I've seen has tried to do both with it. Zero Zone's the only one with a big enough valve that I've seen that actually has been able to actually load it up. I don't know what the port is on the valve, but it's big. I know like the Hill Racks, it's like a DN2, which is like tiny. So going up to a DN4, I remember we were discussing this online the one day, going up to a DN4, which we drilled one out, and what would be the orifice of a DN4, and it worked phenomenal. Really? Yes. Same, we did the same thing with one of the oil lines. We drilled out the DN2 orifice, me and Jake did, and drilled it out to a DN4 just to prove that the we they was transferring oil faster and more efficiently, and the oil problems in that rack went away. Wow it's just it's the orifice is too small on a dn2 to transfer to transfer it efficiently to transfer then, all that oil yeah because the name of the game like when you're transcritical you need to get the oil from point a to point b as fast as possible with it sitting in the separator it's getting picked back up and thrown out through the system mm -hmm. that 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 turbulent flow inside that oil uh, that receiver i'm sorry not receiver the separator is picking that oil back up mm -hmm. and it's taking it back out to the system if oh, you it's too high. Yep. If you drain that oil constantly, it keeps it from happening. So the faster you drain that oil, the better. The the longer the oil sits in the separator, the more chance it's gonna to get picked up and taken back out through the system. 
So as soon as it hits that second glass, that's when you want to blow it out. I personally like to do it on time too. I like really? level and time. If when it's transcritical, I want to switch to time and I want to cycle that thing every two minutes, no matter what. And just keep feeding. Yeah, because I want to get every little bit of oil in there. I don't want to wait till it's got a full glass. I want to wait. I want to drain every bit of oil in there because our oil consumption when we're transcritical is way higher. They say it's like, what, three to five percent higher, but it's way higher than that. Remember, we were talking to Andre and it was significantly higher. Yeah. And as the dense vapor coming from the flash tank increases and gets colder, you move more oil. So what? Transcritical rack. And we could put a flow meter on the oil line of how much oil that it's using. Oh, it uses a shit ton. That's what I'm saying. Like you could physically see it. If you had it like a, a GPM. See, but the, the other problem is a lot of it gets hidden because your low temp compressors, depending on how they're piped are making up a lot of the medium temp. So if you look, when you're running transcritical, your mm -hmm. low temp oil feed rates will be dramatically lower. So like on MT when you're transcritical. Yeah. Like when you're transcritical, like your low temp oil pulse rates, maybe a couple, you know, an hour mm -hmm. medium temp compressors, maybe hundreds an hour. Okay, so you're talking typical piping where the, the discharge of the load temp goes directly in the suction of the medium, right? Yeah, so what happens is all the oil wants to hide out in the, in the low temp cases where it's colder. Yeah, true. The oil logs out there, so after defrost, it all comes back. The, med the low temp compressors are basically getting most of their oil from the suction. Mm -hmm. And their feet, they're, they're basically supplying the, the medium temp with the oil too. Mm -hmm. But the majority of their oils, the low temp compressors is coming down the suction line. So they're prefer, not. Do you prefer having an oil separator on the low temp too? No, I rather just have it on the medium temp. So really? the, the issue you run into is, so that low temp, obviously all the oil is coming back from there. So mm -hmm. you're sep you're going to be separating all the oil. Then you mm -hmm. end up oil logging in one side of the system, mm -hmm. and you end up with this. You have to have some transfer system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, now I get it. Yeah, it. It adds more complexity to it when all you're doing is making it harder for somebody to work on. And that's one more failure point. True. When so, you could just let the oil dump directly in there. Yep. Every time I we have a rack with a dual separator issue, it's not every week. It's not every month, but there's a time or two where the oil all gets stuck in the medium temp or all gets stuck in the low temp. And it's like, the fucking rack goes down and somebody has to go out there and get it to train. Shit. That leads us into what we what else we were going to talk about the deal oil, oil sensors. Yes. Okay. Guys, the, whether it's H E B, I think I N T makes them now or is what's the bits are, is it, is I don't know, it was cure one. It's cure one. So it like, is. It's, yeah. So okay. it has an, so it has an I N T number on or whatever it is, how they do their model numbers. So cure one makes them, there's been some, like, I think Sigma makes some. There, there's a, like a few different brands out there. Mm -hmm. So basically what these things are is they're optical eyes. So they're looking at a reflective, they're shining a beam in there through glass. And if it sees a liquid, then it's going to send a signal back and it's going to close a set of contacts, depending on how it is. Some of these switches are normally open. Some of them are normally closed. It's going to close a set of contacts or open a set of contacts to a valve or the EMS system to signal to drain oil. Now, generally, these are 24 volt DC. So just pay attention to them and, and see, make sure your voltage is correct. I've seen a bunch of them where the 24 volt DC fuses will be blown and they're not you know, functioning and guys write them up and ends up being a power supply issue or they have a low power supply and it's not sensing. Mm -hmm. Easy way to test these, the, the HEB switches are a pain in the ass. When you order the whole switch, get the glass with it too. Don't change the glass out. Leave the glass there. What I do with these to test them is you take a cup, fill it up with oil, put the glass in the oil with the sensor attached to it, pull the, 
the, the sensor in, in glass out of the oil, put it in the oil. If it function, if it's functioning, it's going to close the set of contacts. If it's not, then it's not going to close them. The light won't be changing. So when the light is off on the HEBs, I believe it is, it is, it sees the level. When the light is on, it's empty. Yeah, because that's how they are when the oil fill, when they alarm, right? They alarm red where you have to drop the power to reset them. And except for these don't have a reset. They just go back and forth. The green HEB ones, I don't think I've ever really seen them change. I think it's just the power indicator. The HEBs, uh, we're talking about HEB sensors. You're talking about the blue ones? Yes. Yep. Those are green when they're... So some of them don't change colors. Like some of them just... When it, some of them, when they're red, it has a, it'll just have a red light on it. When it's red, it's not full. When it's off, it's full. It yeah, all depends. So it sounds green, like, green, I think green might be broken. Yeah. So it, it just depends on the sensor. So you need to Google it, guys. Google like how it's, which sensor you have and w- what the action is. But make sure you have voltage and then see how it goes back to the control system. So if you're looking at the controller, like I've seen it do two ways. I've seen that drive a relay that Mm -hmm. drives the oil drain, which is very archaic. Generally, that's not how it's going to be, but it could be you look at the wiring diagram or what usually happens is it goes back to the EMS system and the EMS system is controlling the oil separator drain. Mm -hmm. What's happening is you're going to get a dry contact. So a digital input. So it's just going to get a closure. Mm -hmm. It's going to get a closure and then something in the program, whether it's a flexible combiner, whether it's a, some logic and microthermal or Dan Foss, where it's already set up for the oil drain and it's going to get an input from that oil separator. It's going to say, Hey, my level's high. I'm meeting, I'm telling you my level's high. And then it's going to go through and it's going to have to go through some logic. Generally the way that most of these are set up is the, so we'll say we're using Emerson, for example, it's a flexible combiner. It's generally going to have the input from the oil separator, and then it's going to have an input stating that the medium temp suction is a compressor is running or there's no failure. Because what you don't want is for that thing to say, hey, I got oil, and the racks shut down, and then you're injecting oil in high pressure into the oil reservoir, and then that is venting to the flash tank. Now you're dumping discharge gas into the flash tank when you're in a potentially shut down situation, which is going to cause the flash tank pressure to rise exponentially and blow off. Yeah, because you're boiling off that that liquid at the bottom of the flash tank is going to be at 38 degrees. You're basically just taking hot gas and injecting it right into that 38 degree nice cold liquid, and then it's just... Yeah, you already don't have the room for expansion at that point. There's going to be some some logic in there so generally if you're like any store using emerson if you hit menu 5 14 find the flexible combiners there's going to be in one in there that says oil dump it seems like most of the oems are copying each other and they're they're very simple but it gets a dry contact input from that heb switch to say hey i have an oil level and then it's usually got a software switch an input from the suction group or compressor proof or something to state that the medium temp compressors are running. And then it's going to basically pulse that solenoid. So it's going to turn it on for so many seconds, off for so many seconds, on for so many seconds, off for so many seconds until one of those input conditions is no longer true, meaning it's no longer on. Now, what I've found at most of these sites is they usually have like a five second pulse on and like a 20 second pulse off. It's not enough. So I usually go anywhere from 10 to 15 per second pulse on and then a 20 second pulse off. Let it pulse on longer and drain the oil out of there. And then the other thing, if you're not draining oil on these and especially if it's a hill rack, there is straight inline strainers on there on the oil lines now. So trace the oil line back coming out of the the separator. It's usually there's one in between the separator and the solenoid. And then after that, going to the compressors, there's another one. So if you have 
you're hitting high oil level alarms in the separator, then generally you either have a plug sh- screen on the solenoid or you have a plug strainer in the inline. They plug up constantly. They're like a little, before you start saying it's a bad sensor, I would go through and make sure all that's good first and then check your actual DI operation. So make sure the input's opening and closing and then actually test it. You can't just take it off there because it's going to fault out. You need an actual glass eye to test it. That's why ordering one when you order a spare to keep in the rack is very important. The other thing is if you do lose the optical eye, so say that the sensor goes bad and you're not draining, it's not calling to drain oil anymore. You got two options here. You could either force the optical or the input on and let it keep pulsing the valve constantly for so many seconds on, so many seconds off, or you leave it the valve locked on all the time. I'm not a fan of the valve locked on all the time. Generally, what I'll do is I will edit the flexible combiner. Say it's uh, 20, 20 seconds off period in between. I'll make it like five minutes. So whatever, how many seconds it is, I'll make it like five minutes and let it like, so it'll be on for 10 seconds every five minutes or on for 20 seconds every five minutes. So that way it's still pulsing and draining, but it's not constantly on and it's not constantly injecting gas into the, to the receiver. So well, those, those are just hooked up to ROs on the CPC, right? Correct. They're just hooked up to ROs. You could force it on and let it run the entire time, but if the rack were to shut off, then there's a problem. No, I get it. I get it. I'm just I'm concerned with the more cycle time because it's a mechanical relay. Like oh, how, many, yeah. how many cycles can they really take? They're not oh, a they're not a billions. Re- really? Yeah. So when I was talking to Ryan about this, it's with AC power, it's mm-hmm. Dude, uh, look how many racks you've seen with compressors with four plus cycles a day. Oh, shit. You know what? I didn't think about that. <laughs> so th- think about that. Some of those are old boards. Shit. Now, if you use, like Kaiser was using D- DC solenoids, yeah. okay, they were wearing out after a couple, a thousand or so cycles. 104, 141,000 cycles a year. If you did the 400 cycles a day. Yeah, so I bet you that oil still not cycling that much. Damn. But the, what Kaiser was doing is they were using a DC solenoid coil. CPC contacts are not DC rated. Correct. The coil is. Yeah, but the actual contacts are not DC rated. So it actually derates the contacts. So they were failing after a couple thousand cycles. These racks were failing. So what Kaiser does is... They don't even have an optical eye. At least on the newer X, they're just cycling on time, which is genius. Just keep it rolling. Just keep it rolling. They're just keep, they're, but they're getting all that oil out of there. All that oil out of there. No, that's good. Yeah, the, the only thing is you'd have to make sure you had it in there where where it sh- something shuts it down, right? Well, they do. They have it in there. So if, if the medium temp compressors aren't running, or if there's a, a high pressure condition in the receiver, it shuts it down. Zero zone. I think as the best of both worlds are doing both. They're doing an optical eye and they're doing a time. So that way it keeps it rack from going down. Yeah. I got to admit, I think I like the zero zone setups the most. Really? Yes. Their racks are by far the best laid out, the easiest to work on. Not a fan of the couple laid down receivers they tried, but the everything else though, like phenomenal. Why? Like Why? Why? There's a theory behind that. Why? Because you have less room for failure if something were to go wrong between the liquid level running in the receiver and the flash gas bypass valve. Oh, shit. Yeah, you're okay. Now I get it. Unless, yeah, you'd have to have a pipe that's three feet off the top of the flash tank to make sure you don't get that liquid. I see what you're saying now. Like yeah, it's, You're still picking it up because it's a wet vapor. So, like, you normally, okay, you see your flash tank's six foot tall. Mm-hmm. Yeah you're running at a 30% receiver level. So you may be running at like a foot and a half, two feet. Mm-hmm. Out of five feet. Say you're running a, you know, 36 inch round tank mm-hmm. and you're running at 30%. Oh shit. You'd, you'd have to run it like 15, 20% all the time. Cause you couldn't risk going that high, especially if, yeah. And then 
yeah, I mean, you get somebody that, that juices it up to 40% uh -huh. and it gets a load situation like we were having. And it, it, you get a bunch of cases shut off at night and now it's up, say it creeps up to 50%. Now you're, now your room for marginal error is not very much. Yeah. And you could flood back so bad on that flash gas bypass valve that it'll look like you have super heat on the rack. It'll look like it has, say you're running 33 degrees on the flash gas bypass valve or the receiver and you're running, say, a plus 18 medium temp. Mm -hmm. You could be reading plus 33 degrees on that suction line, but it's pure liquid almost. <laughs> it'll, wash, it'll wash out the oil of the rack instantly. They they should almost have a fucking sight glass on there. So you can see what oh, the hell's yeah. going on there. That, that that's been a huge complaint for of me. Like, why can we not put a sight glass on there so we could see that well, coming through there? To be fair, yeah. there's a there's a very long list of Kevin complaints, but this 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 might be a real feasible one though. That and then temp sensors on both sides of the valve. That would make a lot of sense. Because you mean, be able to sense the, the pressure drop or, or the 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 chain the phase the phase change. Yes, you would be you'd be getting more of a phase change out of there, and then it would be more graphable. Like it usually, your suction temp sensor is like on these racks. It's on it's more it's on the entering side of the accumulator. So you hear that, Adam Chapman? We have to get a sight glass on there. Yeah, th that's why I like the I do the Danfoss CCMT valves. Because they do have a sight glass on the valve. Only certain valves, though. I think it's a CCMT-16 has a valve. Has yeah. a sight glass on it. Yeah, I don't think... Uh, yeah, because a lot of them don't. Yeah, so they, that valve has a sight glass on there. So you could actually see it going through there. Like, you, That's that big bastard, right? That so little it, big bastard where it has the pressure transducer actually in, oh. into the valve? No, so same series of valves, but a CCMT-16 is smaller. It looks oh. like a T, basically. Okay. It looks like it took a T, and the stem is like six inches long. And the motor is like up six inches from the valve. Those Carnot racks you started up probably had them. Or no, that may have been too big. But you, they generally use the same valve for everything. But those have a sight glass on them, so it's nice you could see it going through there. But that's another, you know, whole issue with not having that sight glass there or being able to see that visibility. And if you have an if you have a Danfoss 326 and something's like awry with that, you're pretty much screwed because you're not going to be able to see it unless you're on site. Because you can't see any of those readings without being on site. Yeah. Unless you're on a Danfoss controller. Correct. Which is super not cool that they won't release the Modbus tables. Yeah, that's one benefit that you have from that. But everything's supposed to be open protocol now. I'm surprised we haven't went to Jace controllers yet. What Novar is? Oh, it must be nice to get free stuff, and then I get something and I have to give it back to you. That's <laughs> <laughs> for the training center. Just I got us. I'm finishing setting it up. It's a bitch to set up from scratch. That is a bitch to set up. What that Novar controller? Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to Georgia next week. I'm go visit. I'm visiting one of our places in Fayetteville, and then I'm heading out to Corral. I have a day of training out there. They're gonna teach me how to use all their stuff. Must um, be nice. And then I'm going to teach class up in Tennessee. You're such a dick. <laughs> I just I have to figure out how to do all this Dan Falls programming on myself. I gotta get Chris Brown on here. I call yeah. Him he hasn't called me back yet. I had to call Dave tomorrow, so maybe I'll try to sweet talk him. I was going to say they put a, they, cause I was asking quite specific questions on 326 and Chris was out of town. So who handles but them? Cause 326. I don't know who does the actual, Chris knows a lot about them. I don't know who does all the diagnostics on those. They really had a call though, because I, I know that controller pretty well. Cause we, I spent a lot of time with it. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling more with the iPro trying to get that all figured out. It'll be fun. All right. Yep. I think that's it. We're good. Yep. Let's end it. All right, guys. Have a great night.